Hi everyone, this is Jason Barak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is Dominic Frisbee. Dominic is one of the UK's leading voiceover artists, and he's also an actor and a well-known comedian over there. Uh, he woke up, and now he's a private investor who invests in resources, and he also writes for Money Week magazine over in the UK. So thank you very much, Dominic, for coming on a Wall Street for Main Street podcast. My pleasure, Jason. Great. Now, Dominic, you have a very interesting background. Uh, you're in the entertainment industry. You're very successful in the entertainment industry, uh, judging by your bio here that I'm reading. Um, how did you wake up to all of this that was going on? Uh, what, what sparked the uh, light there in, in your head about the global financial situation, the problem with money, precious metals, etc.? Yeah, I've always been reasonably interested in uh, things financial, and uh, I've always kind of read magazines and followed it a little bit and in 2005 I had a bit of money and it's a long story Jason but it, it's I suppose I've always been interested in in things financial and I've always followed financial markets and I've speculated a bit here and there and sometimes had a bit of luck and sometimes not done so well um, but in 2005 um, we had a bit of money in the family and we wanted to invest it and um, my dad wanted to put the money into property and um, I was saying that that's a bad idea and we, we had this kind of big family argument and in the end it kind of fell to me to manage the money and um, we didn't want to go down the kind of fund manager route because I hated not only the fees that they charge but the language that they use. I found it very alienating and incomprehensible and as soon as people start using obfuscatory language I always find it it always makes me rather suspicious. And so I started reading capriciously and, you know, very quickly on the Internet came across gold and um, and, you know, why one should buy gold. And suddenly the, it, it made total sense to me. And um, suddenly as well, you know, I could very clearly see why gold was a good investment. Now, gold had risen by quite a lot in 2005, 2006 in US dollar terms, but actually in pounds it hadn't written risen by so much so even though you know many people who maybe got in a couple of years earlier in the US uh, were ahead of me um, in pound terms you know you know I timed it reasonably well I didn't catch the very bottom but you know I got in by as you know by the luck of circumstance at a reasonably good time and then of course once you make an investment and you've got the responsibility to, to manage this money I started reading more and more and um, you know, from gold, there's a, it's it's not it's there aren't many steps between gold and Austrian economics, and and um, you know very quickly I I became very captivated by everything that I was read, and and um, and it's you know this whole I do think we're living through historic times, and it's very compelling and very engaging, and um, with my background in voiceovers, I then started up a podcast, and one of the people who I interviewed, a lady called Merrin Somerset Webb, who writes for Money Week magazine, then offered me a column writing for Money Week and um, you know that column proved to be reasonably popular because uh, because as a lay person I put stuff in a language that lay people can follow and um, you know it's just kind of grown and grown from there really and uh, yeah I mean I, 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 I do think we're living through historic times. Yeah and you know it's actually a good thing that you start off as a lay person because you didn't have the bad habits you weren't taught the Keynesian economics you weren't taught in the finance departments of universities about that you have to believe in modern portfolio theory that you have to believe in the efficient market hypothesis that you have to believe in the cap uh, capital asset pricing model which is you know all these things work and that's how a lot of the finance and economics people that go into Wall Street or into the London version you know in your fire economy which yeah. is similar to what the New York City has set up it's just ridiculous. I mean, my background is not quite the exact same as yours and when I woke up, but I, I worked as a stockbroker for a while, and uh, I took all my licenses, and I sat in the sales meetings, and, you know, you're just behind the curtain there, and it's a sales job. I mean, they don't teach you anything useful about the markets or anything like that. You're handed a piece of paper, basically, and you're told to sell whatever's the highest commission product if you want to keep your job. So, um, and, and, you know, they don't want to educate their clients. They want to use fancy language. They don't want to uh, help educate their clients, like I said. They don't even want to educate, like I said, their own salespeople, really, for the most part. So it's a really sad industry. Um, 
I, I guess like decades ago, things used to be different in the industry. Uh, there was more win-win scenarios, but uh, now like I guess the industry has changed to a more of a rent-seeking one, where people you know focus on stealing money from their own customers instead of making their customers money and then you know growing your profits and building your business that way. Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with you that it's become a rent-seeking industry. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I never had any interest in being, you know, in, in being a fund manager or anything like uh, of that type. A few people have approached me and suggested that I uh, manage money, but it's just not something that I would want to do. I, I find it hard enough managing my own. It's interesting what you say about, you know, my dad's a, a writer and, you know, he, he doesn't have an economics background, but he always used to lecture me when I was younger about, Keynes and Keynesian economics and but I, I, I'm of the belief that if Keynes was alive today he wouldn't advocate what is now understood as Keynesian economics um, he's very clever Keynes he had a great intellect and he was um, flexible enough to say that when the facts change I change my mind and whereas some of his government spending might have been right for the for the 1930s I don't think it's appropriate for now because um, the economic base is different well, yeah, there there's some stuff that has been bastardized by uh, you know, the neo-Keynesians like Krugman and those yeah. guys, but I mean the the way the a lot of Keynes's framework was just about, you know, in consumer spending instead of saving and investing and building the economy that way because I mean if you if you produce more than you consume and you build a savings base, I mean you can consume with some of the money, but if you start consuming massively before you produce, I mean that's putting the cart before the horse. And it's just – it's not sustainable over the long term. It's like a family massively running up their credit card, and they don't have any money coming in to pay the credit card bill, and then they just go from one credit card to the next, maxing them out. So it, in general, like Keynes had some interesting points, some of the stuff I've read uh, from him. But uh, I mean I just don't agree with a lot of the stuff because uh, he was more of a collectivist, and he was always you know, about like the banking system, maintaining a lot of control, deciding who gets the money and who gets the loans, whereas you know, I'm more of an Austro-libertarian where things should be decentralized, and you know, if people have savings and they want to invest in a business and they should be able to do it, they shouldn't need the banking system to decide that uh, the banking system has to give all the money to all the businesses to build them up. Yeah. I happen to agree with most of the principles of Austrian economics. Uh, but the fact is, given the situation in which we currently find ourselves, Austrian economics is a little bit too extreme. Um, you know, to make the transition to the ideal, unregulated, free market Austrian world, it's just not viable, given the entrenched political and economic systems and financial systems that we have. It's just too extreme a jump. So a lot of the time... It's kind of a little bit fantastic and idealized. It's so I think Keynes, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, it sounds like I'm defending Keynes, but he was a practical man and he was prepared to compromise ideals in order to, to, to get stuff through. And I'm sure, you, you know, I happen to agree with, say, the principles of Mises or um Rothbard or but it, it's they're just too extreme and you have to do stuff gradually and incrementally and where Keynes was strong is that like I say he was a practical man yeah and I mean, the macroeconomic situation, it's just like if you've read all the headlines and you spend, you say you spend a lot of time reading, I mean, it's pretty depressing, a lot of the stuff that's just coming out. And in my opinion, from what I see, I just see worsening stagflation in the in the developed world. Like I, the, I think the developing world is a little bit different because they have more of a savings base. Yeah. And um, except for China, they're not misallocating their capital quite as bad as the, the developed world is. But uh, do you see stagflation then in uh, like the UK and in the US, or do you see things differently? I see awful stagflation. I see an awful uh, economy dominated by rent seekers. And um, I see all sorts of ridiculous, like, you know, when this government came to power, they made lots of noises about austerity. And uh, we were praised quite a lot from overseas for these austerity measures that we were going to implement. Uh, and this government is now three or four years old. In that time, national debt has grown by 40 <laughs> percent. 
So I ask, where's the austerity? And everyone is now saying our economy's in trouble, look, austerity's failing. But it was never even properly implemented. So, and it's just so politically unpalatable. You know, if you if you go to the electorate with an auster on an austerity platform, you will not be elected. So, you know, it's it's a very difficult kind of catch twenty two situation. Whereas, you know, you can't. This is why I was kind of talking about Keynes's practicality, but the the realities of the situation are that what needs to be done can't be done because the politician who wants to do what needs to be done can't get elected. Yeah, that's a very interesting point, and this is the problem is you have the politicians and you have the central planners and the bureaucrats and a lot of these neo-Keynesians who are directing the policy. They want to maintain their political power, and they want to you know, stay in office. Everything's about the short term. It's, it's complete rent-seeking, and then that's balancing it out. They, they don't want – they don't want a long-term solution because, you know, that threatens their political base there. Yeah. And I mean, we have we know. have our housing market is in is a mess. Did you know they brought in this? There's a real attack on the rich going on in London. And uh, they brought in this new law where houses that cost over two million pounds are liable to seven percent stamp duty and 15 percent stamp duty if you buy it in, in a com in the name of a company. And since they brought in this stamp duty six months or so ago, transactions have fallen by 59 percent. Uh, and at the bottom end of the housing market, you know, people are finding it very difficult to borrow money. And so transactions are down. And yet, rather than just let the housing market purge itself, despite the fact that transactions are so low, uh, young people and first time buyers are finding it still impossible to get on the housing market, either because they can't borrow money or because house prices are still too high. And, you know, on the one hand, they're attacking the rich. But on the other hand, they're they're introducing, you know, we have artificially low interest rates, uh, which means that people who would otherwise be forced to trade and move can stay in the position that they're in. In fact, they daren't move because they don't want to lose the cheap mortgage deals that they've got. So they've just brought total atrophy to the housing market and it just can't purge itself. And I just see no solution around the corner. They've and, and the problems that we have in the housing market, you know, proliferate elsewhere in the economy. And, and you know, you'd think that they wouldn't do it, but they have taken us down the Japanese route. Well, yeah, a lot of the Western world is going down that route where they're they're trying to hide the inflation numbers that they've created, and then they're increasing more taxes too. So, which in my macro views, like I said, I, I'm more of a stagflationist here. I just see worsening stagflation in the developed world increasing until m money velocity and inflationary expectations just start picking up. Um, Let's let's uh, transition here because you know we could talk about the housing market the whole podcast. You have California, which is which is a disaster. Yeah, California has all these businesses in the United States leaving. They're charging massive property taxes increase, massive corporate taxes increase. Uh, it's now well over fifty percent income tax in California now. If you're a businessman there, so for your personal and your business income taxes, it's massive. And uh, you know you you have basically uh, a lot of the United States, which is turning into Europe. Yeah, you know, I mean, but, you know, at least your housing market has fallen. And, you know, I mean, my mum's just bought a house in California, actually. She's retiring there. Um, and she's bought a house for $150,000, a third of an acre with a swimming pool. And that, to me, is is a wonderful buy. And, and, and I, I wish her, you know, I'm, I'm quite proud of her and I'm very excited for her because she's bought a nice house in a nice area where the climate's very nice. And she you know, has the potential to enjoy a very comfortable retirement. But, you know, the idea of being able to buy a house for $150,000 in the UK, it's just, it's just absurd. It's fantastical. At least house prices have fallen there to a realistic level. Yeah, so, so you're saying then that a lot of the UK, not even just London then, is inflated real estate prices like the New York City area and D.C. area? Because uh, I, I live right outside of D.C., Dominic. Oh, do you? And 
Yeah, I live right outside of Washington, D.C., okay. so I see everything firsthand. I see all the government. Uh, I, I know some banking lobbyists around here, too. I was in Washington, <laughs> D.C. two weeks ago, actually, and uh, it was amazing. I mean, it's stank of the state. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you've had a boom yeah. in Washington, D.C. because of all the tax revenue, because of all the, you know, the growth in government. And then you compare it to Baltimore next door, which is rather depressed. I, I liked Baltimore. Yeah, Baltimore looks like a third world country. There's just, there's traffic lights everywhere. Uh, there's the money traffic lights and the stoplight traffic lights and the and all the ticket stuff outside of the schools. And then there's a lot of unpaved roads. There's boarded up houses. DC is the exact opposite. There's a potential. There's a humongous housing bubble here developing here in DC. There's over 180 luxury condo uh, humongous facilities like what happened, you know, during, in Miami Beach in those areas that are being built. Yeah. Those things are being built now here in the DC area. You have celebrity chefs moving and building massive amounts of new restaurants here in the DC mm. area. So well, as long DC's as government keeps expanding, that DC will keep growing. Yes, unfortunately, but this is at the this is at the expense though of the private sector. Absolutely, so you're, yeah. you're you're not seeing any real job growth, in my opinion, outside of a few sectors. You know, from small businessmen and entrepreneurs, you're seeing the large corporations that are tied in with the government, that are in bed with the government. I mean, they're borrowing a lot of them at zero. They're getting government deals. They're getting um, you know unbidded contracts and things like that. So the the corruption here in the United States. Um, yeah, is really like it's really depressing. Unfortunately, this is not like what I learned about with capitalism and free markets and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, but now the the question I'm continually asking myself is when is all this going to change? I thought it was going to happen uh, back in 2008, and it just hasn't. It's just business as usual. And like I say, I think policymakers have committed us to the Japanese route, and I just think this atrophy could go on for years which is awful for everyone but um that's well it's awful for everyone but the people in power <laughs> well yeah <laughs> they keep their power and they keep their salaries yeah absolutely but um you know meanwhile progress is made in less regulated countries and we're overtaken yeah exactly the capital and the resources are being massively misallocated and you know that's where i think it leads to gold. I think in, in either scenario, inflation or deflation, stagflation, hyperinflation, you know, any kind of these weird mixes that uh, some other macro analysts have come up with, I think all roads are going to lead to gold. What do you think about that? Well, uh, you know, I'm a gold bug and I like gold, but I'm under no illusions about it. And I know how it can disappoint as well as it can satisfy, but I'm very keen on gold for a number of reasons. Um, if you look at a chart of gold since 1999 or since 2001, it's displayed a very consistent repeating pattern, which is that it has kind of six or nine months of rises, and then it will have a period of consolidation and the, where it kind of trades flat and retraces a lot of the gains it's made over the previous period of rises. And often that period of consolidation reflects the... Um, the magnitude of the pre previous period of rises and it's had this kind of stair-stepping pattern it's very apparent if you look at it on a log chart and we obviously had a, a, a period of great rises up until gold reached $1,920 an ounce back in September 2011 and we've been in one of its kind of sideways frustrating consolidation periods ever since then and these consolidation periods I think from memory, one of the worst was after May 2006, and it was about 18 months before gold broke out to new highs. And we've been in this one for about 14 months. I now think we've seen the lows at 1520. We've retested those lows three times or four times, even though three times we've retested and it's held. And gradually, gold is now creeping up. When I last looked, it was about 1750. And it's making higher lows. Um, there's a lot of resistance at 1800, but once it goes through 1800, um, I think it can make its way to 1920 again, where it'll find more resistance. But once it breaks through that, you know, we're properly off to the races. There's no overhead resistance. And like I say, looking at gold cyclically, I think this period of consolidation, the worst is over. Um, and I'm looking for new high. Well, I'm looking for the old highs to be retested, probably not this year, but maybe early next year. Um, I'm certainly looking for 1800 to be retested this year. And um, 
yeah, like I say, I think we're getting set. We're all, we're already in the early stages of one of Gold's big up moves, and you know, you can get hung up. Is gold an asset class? Is it a commodity? Is it money? And you can get all hung up on the definitions. But the fact is, it benefits during periods of monetary instability. Now, monetary instability and the debasement of um, currency is systemic. And so, you know, gold should benefit from that. And um, one thing that makes me a little bit hesitant is the COT reports, not as bullish as I'd like. That's the positions that the futures traders in Chicago have taken. But apart from that, the technicals look good. The uh, gold sitting above um, all the right moving averages. Uh, it's trending up. And like I say, I think this period of consolidation has come to end, an end. And one another additional fact that uh, <clears throat> makes me smile, I wouldn't necessarily bet any money on it, is that the gold does very well uh, under Democrat governments. I think the average price gain for a democratic, democratic, democratic term is over 350%. Uh, Obama's last term saw a 240% rise, um, and gold actually made its last low a week after Obama was elected. I think this time it made its low on the Monday before Obama was elected. That was at about 1670. And yeah, gold does very well under the Democrats, and gold bizarrely does very well during the second term of a president during a president's second term is some reason it does a lot better during a president's second term than it does during the first term so all these little facts are all you know extra little reasons they might be coincidental or there might be some fundamental reason behind it perhaps i don't know democrats tend to spend more than republicans who tend to have a tighter fiscal policy maybe that's why but gold does well during a um during under Democrats and during a president's second term. So that's another reason to be bullish. Now, if gold were to rise 350 um, percent, which is the average under a Democratic term um, from its low of about 1700 when Obama was elected, you're looking at gold over six thousand dollars by the time Obama's term ends. Now, I would have thought that's extremely unlikely, but nevertheless, you know, who knows what could happen? It's possible. So. For all those reasons, I like gold. Now, yeah, uh, I was looking at the long-term charts for uh, the miners to the GDX, and the long-term charts look very good. Looks like a nice double bottom is in, and a cup with a handle is forming. Um, now, ab about silver, um, what's your opinion then on silver then? Are, are you a silver bull as well, or do you think gold's a lot safer then compared to silver because uh, because for whatever reason – uh, you know, there's uh, the the larger pools of capital view gold as more liquid. Uh, the more people view gold as money than silver, even though financial history, you know, thousands of years of financial history say silver has also been money too. Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Gold isn't an asset class in the same way that silver is. But if gold rises, silver will rise as well. The question is, which will rise more? I think silver will rise by more than gold does. But it would also fall by more than gold does. Um, you know, I like silver a lot. Um, it's for all its volatility. It's actually a pretty consistent chart if you look at it over a longer period. You know, there's a hell of a lot of resistance of fifty dollars. But once you get through fifty dollars, you know, God goodness knows what's possible. We may never get through fifty dollars. Um, there's a lot of very extreme thinkers who like silver. Um, I don't think as extremely about it as as you know, many of the stuff I read on the net, um, the writers of that do. But, you know, I like silver and, you know, I own silver and I'm very bullish about it. Um, funnily enough, you know, a lot of the gold shares have been real disappointments. But some of the silver shares have been better, better buys than the gold. Some of the silver growth companies have been better buys than the gold um, companies. I think this is the time for the gold producer uh, and for the company that is cashed up and coming into production and that can get itself into production with a minimum of fuss. Um, I'm not so sure about explorers. I mean, you know, maybe we'll come to a time when huge premiums will be placed on uh, the value of all bodies in the ground, but we're not at that time at the moment. And most of the explorers are in serious, serious trouble. Um, 
And, you know, I've read and I find persuasive the arguments that suggest that actually a gold explorer is a liability, not an asset. Um, so I'm not sure about the explorers, but, you know, if, if people can produce gold safely, um, uh, you know, in a country where there isn't too much political risk, where their, their minds won't be um, possessed by the government or anything like that, you know, those producers should do really well you know if they can produce gold at a thousand dollars an ounce and sell it for seventeen hundred and make seven hundred dollars an ounce they'll make a lot of money and that should be reflected in the shares whether the explorers will eventually catch up with that i can only hope they will but um gold shares you know we've heard a lot of promises about them but they're a very different beast to gold itself yeah, I agree, and I've invested a lot in gold and silver shares, and um, a, a lot of these companies, like the, the juniors don't have any cash flow coming in, so th I mean they're going to sell shares to survive, which you know is very dilutionary and it's going to lower the share price, but a lot of these producers that have produced gold, they just haven't, the management teams haven't done what they said. I mean, you know, when, when they say the production costs at the mine are going to be a certain amount, like there's always unexpected delays or the co production costs are much, much higher than they said. And, you know, they're just not using the capital that they have very efficiently, and they're not producing a profit. They're not returning the, uh, you know, dividends to shareholders. They're doing, like with Barrick and some of these other guys, they're doing really stupid acquisitions. <laughs> they're, right. they're paying $6 billion for a deposit that's 10 years away from going into production. And the, the amount of money, you know, that's going to be required to, to bring the deposit into production is going to be many billions of dollars more by the time the mine's ready to go. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, until the, the, the industry itself becomes more efficient, I mean, the business model I really like that I've made the most money in investing is the streaming model, the yeah. royalty in the streaming model. But those guys don't really do any of the hard work. They just invest in good management teams then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just so frustrated with some companies that – you know, there's loads of companies that go, we've got gold at surface, we could produce it, all we need to do is truck ore, we could be in production really quickly, and they've been saying this for several years, and you're like, well, get into production then, because, you know, in 2010, the markets were so good, and you were telling them, like, get into production, no, no, we're going to drill, we're going to drill, and so they all raised loads of money and drilled, and they might have proved up, you know, X amount of ounces more, but they've diluted themselves to oblivion. They've got no cash flow, and now they can't get into production. If they had got themselves into production, even only minimum amounts of cash flow, they'd be buoyant now, and they'd be, you know, be in a position to push ahead. I can think of so many companies like that, just stupid people in charge. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The the level, the quality of management. I mean, for every Keith Newmeyer of First Majestic Silver or Nolan Watson or some of the other really good managers, there's Keith, dozens. Keith is a clever man. Keith yes. got into silver because he he decided he liked silver. And Keith's much more bullish about silver than I am. But he identified silver back in the late '90s, early noughties as a bull market waiting to happen. And you know. Keith, First Majestic produced significant amount of lead and zinc, but he, Keith just leaves it on the stockpile for somebody else to, to take later, further down the road. He, it's, uh, he, he's just only interested in being a pure silver play. And, you know, Keith, it, it, there was a lot of frustration with Keith in the kind of late noughties because he kept raising money to get. But, you know, he did it at the right time. And, you know, he's taken that company into production and, you know, it was meandering around three dollars for ages and everyone was getting really wound up. And then suddenly, boom, it's twenty dollars stock. And a lot of people have earned a lot of money. And now Keith is in a position to take out other companies and, and is doing so when it suits him at the price that suits him. And you wish that other CEOs had that vision that Keith has, but they don't. Yeah, Keith is the exception and not the rule. I mean, I, I've interviewed him before, too, and he's just he really understands the silver market and he knows how the volatility in the price and he knows that he has cash flow coming in. And when the price of silver corrects, he has cash flow and it's time for him to possibly do another acquisition. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, in, in that three dollar share range, that's actually when you said it was frustrating. That's actually when I bought my shares in First Majestic Silver, because like as a contrarian, I'm a value investor. It's really good to go in and buy those when people are frustrated, when the weak hands are leaving, when the when the market is in a consult or the shares are in yeah. a consolidation. You know, back in, in 2008, in that crash in 2008, First Majestic shares were trading below a dollar. I mean, it's just incredible to think how cheap yeah, they were. The, the, I think the value it was I, I think cents silver, or something. 
Oh, Silver okay. Wheaton, I think, dropped to three dollars yeah. a share too. Yeah, the valuations were just insane. Yeah. Like there were so many. Good, Apple dropped to ninety. There, it, the valuations were insane for a lot of the companies. People yeah. were pricing in the end of the world, and uh, they didn't anticipate the Fed coming in and bailing everyone out yeah. by printing money. Yeah. Well, um, in, in wrapping up this interview, uh, Dominic, uh, please tell our listeners uh, more about your book and uh, some of your other work and projects that you're working on now. Um, yeah, well, you know, I write a weekly column for Money Week, and if anyone wants to read that, probably the best thing to do is to follow me on Twitter, at Dominic Frisbee, and then from there, you know, I, I post links to anything that I'm doing that's interesting. I've got a website, DominicFrisbee.com. Uh, I'm just in the course of finishing a book, uh, which you can pre-order. Um, it's called Life After the State, and you can pre-order it at uh, Unbound is the name of the publisher. It's, I'm crowdfunding it. It's called unbound.co.uk slash life after the state. And you can find the book there and pre-order it. Very good. I uh, just want to thank you again for your time, Dominic. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on again for another Wall Street for Main Street podcast in the near future. My pleasure, Jason. And thank you very much. And uh, I hear you've just done an interview for Gold Money. So uh, that'll be good to listen to that. I also present shows for gold money so uh, maybe one day we'll 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 reverse this and i'll ask you the questions sounds good it would be my pleasure